It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Uh, another, another, another interesting, interesting day on the COVID front. Uh, we have now reached 66 million, well, exceeded 66 million of us uh, having contracted the COVID virus. Uh, that's 20%. 20% of the country has now been infected. Um, this according to Johns Hopkins University. Uh, conservatively, we've had, what, about 853,000 dead. Uh, I would argue that number is probably considerably higher. Just like I would argue the number of people infected is going to be higher than the 66 million. But we're spiking again. And there are some, some of the voices out there going, you know, actually I had someone email me this. We should have COVID uh, parties. We should have Omicron parties, you know, kind of like when I was a kid, they used to have, you know, like, like you know, uh, mumps and measles parties where, you know, if you, you know, chicken pox parties where you, you would bring all the kids together so they all get sick. Um, and, and a lot of people, you know, it was much better back in the old days. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, but to get to this, this magical place, and I was thinking about this today, to get to the magical place of herd immunity where we don't have to worry about it, you know, killing, it's about 80% of the people having to get infected by it. So we're, we've got 20% now and we've only got, you know, another how many more to go? Um, uh, and then how many more dead are we talking about? How much more? I mean, and and this is one of those things where you go, at what point, oh, do we stop being so, so ridiculous uh, on this? Uh, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. In fact, I had an incident today, uh, in fact, where I'm, I'm in an environment, in a medical environment, uh, where a woman's insisted she's not, you know, if she, her chin was well protected. Let's just put it that way. Her chin, chin well protected. Uh, but, you know, the nose and mouth, not so much. And she's like, well, I have a mask. Isn't that enough? And you go, no, dum-dum, that is not enough. Uh, the idea is to use it properly. Use it properly. That That's how we do that. That's how we do this. Now, some, some good news. Um, after my wife goes and buys a ton of N95 masks, and thank you, dear, uh, the Biden administration now plans to uh, distribute millions of them uh, for free. High quality N95 masks across the country through pharmacies and community sites. Uh, this evidently is going to happen on Wednesday. Uh, it's reported that there are something like 773 million N95 masks stored in the national stockpile. Uh, we've gotten them from about 12 manufacturers. So there are some, some good masks out there, uh, and they are going to be um, free. So thank you for, for, for doing that now, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, now, ours are made in the U.S., and I'm, I would guarantee, um, and I would guarantee that uh, Joe Biden had better Oh, had those better be made here in the U.S. And I believe they are uh, that simple. Uh, I'm, I'm now looking at this, though, and I'm going, of course, of course, now they choose to do this. Should have done this a while ago. Uh, should have happened a while ago, especially, you know, a couple of days ago before my wife decided now would be a good time to go spend all that money. Yeah, thanks for that, dear. Uh, also, also, evidently, you know, some new uh, some COVID tests are going to be available free uh, at, I guess it's, uh, what is it, covidtests.gov. Um, I guess that went live today. Uh, there are limited capacity at the moment, but uh, I guess each residential address in the country is eligible for four tests. 
Uh, I guess all you have to do is go to covidtests.gov. Uh, much like on the you know the three o'clock in the morning shows, uh, where they're they're hocking you you know limited time uh, supplies are limited. Hurry, do it now. Uh, there you go, because they're saying that yes, supplies are limited, uh, but more are on the way. Now, what's interesting to me, and again, I this is stuff that if it were me, I would have done this months ago. Uh, this should have been now. Who knows where our supply numbers were? Uh, I'm not involved in that conversation. Uh, who knew, you know, what we were worried about for the front line? We didn't want to get caught in another moment like we did at the beginning uh, during the last administration with the pants down, not having enough uh, PPE for our emergency first responders. And a look, the reality is, and this is where I give the CDC a little pass on the early, you know, we shouldn't go run and get masks right now kind of thing is because they were worried about, you know, protecting the front line people in hospitals and, and that stuff. And I, I kind of get it, uh, but for me, immediately ramping this up and just handing them out, this idea that you got to go find your own masks, nonsense. We should have been getting good quality ones from the beginning, from the start. Uh, and now, finally, we're going to get into that and the testing. Uh, this might help a little bit. Uh, but the weird thing is, is we're still in this in this divide where even if you're getting it for free, I still have people, no, we're not, not going to make me do anything. I'm, I'm, I'm an American, damn it. I can do whatever I want. And you go, how about, you know, being decent? What happened there? Now, I've been getting hammered from the right wing. Uh, virtually all of their media outlets are going, you know, Joe Biden's ruined all this. And this is Joe Biden's pandemic. And Joe Biden, you know, did this and didn't do that. And, you know, he's, he's horrible. The country's going in all the wrong directions. You know, like they do. You know, their hair is on fire because they need to raise money and they need to keep their base. They need to keep the base fed full of of outrage candy. Because it is what they do very well. You have to give them credit. Uh, they do know how to to rile the faithful and and telling them that, you know, this is all Joe Biden's fault gives them license then to, to you know basically go against anything the administration uh, wants to do. Like, you know, hand out masks. But I find it interesting we're in this moment where now Republicans are kind of pivoting and completely attacking the administration. And and I'll argue this has everything to do with the fact that, you know, thank you, uh, Senate. We don't seem to be getting anything done. It seems like a good time to attack. And if I'm them, I probably do, too. Uh, this is why I'm, I'm trying to say, uh, Democrats, get get your stuff together. Just kind of say it. Uh, but yeah, there's a there's a lot of this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts today. Uh, you can email me Rick at the RickSmithShow.com or give us a call one eight six six four one six Rick one eight six six four one six seven four two five. If you got a thought, question, comment on on any of that. Now, good news today. Little good news. Little good news. The January sixth committee, uh, they have issued subpoenas for the Trump Legal Brain Trust, uh, the Rudy Giuliani. Uh, Ella, Jenna Ellison, Sidney Powell, and Boris Epstein. Uh, they have been subpoenaed for testimony and documents. Uh, now, the chairman, uh, Chairman Thompson, said the four individuals uh, that were subpoenaed uh, advanced unsupported theories about election fraud, pushed efforts to overturn the election results, and were in direct contact with the former president about attempts to stop the counting of the electoral votes. Meaning, some of these people were probably involved in that Eastman memo and they look, they should know. Now, uh, I know they're all going to claim a client attorney privilege. I know that's going to come. I am kind of interested to see if, if there was actually a retainer paid, if Trump actually paid them for anything. Just kind of throwing it out there. Uh, also today, the January 6th committee uh, has subpoena and obtained records of phone numbers associated with, uh, with the, the dumbest Trump child, Eric, and the other one's former wife, Kimberly Gafoyle. Uh, so, um, digging, digging, getting a little bit deeper, more information. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm getting a little happier with the Department of Justice, getting a little bit happier with Benny Thompson and the committee, you know, finally starting to get the ball moving. Wish it had been months ago. And as I said, I understand, yes, so please save the email. 
uh, that there are two separate components here. There's the political, the committee, and 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 that, and then there's the legal, the ju judicial side, uh, with the DOJ, and that they are much more deliberate, much slower, and that they need to be much slower. Uh, I think that is a good thing and a good way to go. Uh, but there, there's the difference. Uh, so so that's where my mind goes. Uh, I'm, I'm excited that maybe we're going to start finally holding someone accountable. And that would be, a, I think, a pretty good thing. If we could finally hold someone accountable for their actions and, and for the stuff that's gone on. Uh, don't you? I mean, on a certain, a certain level. Uh, it, it just is. It is what it is. Uh, let's go to the phone lines. We have, we've got Kurt on line one. Kurt, how are we doing? I'm doing good, Rick. How about yourself? Uh, I can't complain. What's on your mind, brother? I was kind of, I want to talk about the, uh, the Senate and this, the freedom to vote. Um, I get like, <clears throat> I've been getting like maybe 10, 15, um, Messages, emails, all the organizations wanting to call Kirsten Cinema, and in the last month, I would say I probably got two hundred of them. Wow! And and my thing is, is like I, I realize that's good, and I think we need to do that. And we're, I think that the right wing has us focused on, you know the. To, to call Kirsten Cinema because they're good at doing they're good at doing the messaging for the Democrats and we still have 280 some days to be able to vote and we're not talking about the, the primary election to me the primary election is so important and we can pick these candidates that stand for voting rights and if we win, we don't necessarily lose the, uh, the, the the right to vote. And to me, I think this this midterm, when they were telling us in 2020 that that's the most important election, I was thinking about 2022 because to me, this one is mo the most important. And I'm just... I think we're getting too caught up into the, you know, what's going on with the Senate because there's so many other things and it's ripping us apart. I mean, we're fighting so many things and I think we're missing that moment. No, I, there's there's a lot going on here. You're right. Uh, I'm I'm in the hair on fire category over voting because I see what a lot of these states are doing and how they're they're you know they're already in the um, the next rig mode on how they're going to block people from voting, how, you know, in, in some states that they're setting up a system to, to throw votes out, how they're, how they're setting up a system right. to possibly at the end of the election change. Um, there, there's so much that's not being overseen. And my problem is, is right. there are so many of these states that are going to start doing some really, really tricky stuff that I fear we have a Florida, uh, uh, you know, every election cycle going forward. And, and, and that, right. that, to me, is a problem. Uh, and also, you know, they're doing a masterful job of of what Democrats do well, uh, getting people, you know, to vote by mail and, uh, you know, the early voting stuff. They're doing a, a bunch of right. what they can do to make that more difficult. So that's my concern. Right. Um, and now, I'm with you on the part that I don't think the, the voting is, thing is going to pass. Uh, we should be spending a lot more energy in the streets. Uh, mobilizing people to jump over those hurdles or or knock through those hurdles, uh, but you know while we have a chance, I think calling cinema is not a bad thing. I don't think it's going to matter. I don't think mansion or cinema is going to matter. And here in a second, I, you know, probably right. talk about that. But I, I do think that we need to do the, more organizing in the street current. I think you're right on that. Right. I spent three days. I Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I spent phone banking down in Texas for two candidates that are running. Because our primary, the the primary starts on March first, right? And there is so much confusion, Rick, because of the of the redistricting, and I was spending time explaining where to. Go. I don't live in Texas; I'm in Arizona, and 
I'm sitting here explaining their district to their new district. I had to pull up a map to just figure out this was in, uh, we were phone banking in Austin and people are just so confused. And what really disturbed me, Rick, what really bothered me was, so I made 200, 200 and like 10 calls where I actually got a voice to pick up in 130 of, and this is in Democrat, this is Democrat and independent. 130 people just hung up on me. They did not want to talk. Yeah. And the ones that I did get to talk, they were so angry. And I just, you know, I just sat there and let them, you know, get it out. And, and I'm like, I understand. No, and good I, on you, I go, man. That's, uh, that's a lot of phone banking. And, and good on you. If we could, if we could clone you, uh, that would be a great thing. But, Kurt, I appreciate the, the call <laughs> and the thoughts, man. That That's fantastic. Yeah. Good stuff. So, yeah, I just got a feeling there's going to be a lot of stuff, a lot of hurdles to get over in this in this midterm. No, we got uh, a lot of work to do. Appreciate the call, Kurt. Thank you so much. Uh, No, and look, at the the end of the day, he's right. The the anger level on every front is way up. And this is where, you know, one of the things I learned in 2011 with the recall in Wisconsin, uh, the same thing. The voters were just tired of hearing, tired of being inundated, tired of being berated. By, you know, messaging from from any side. They just wanted to live their lives for the most part. And while, you know, people like me who, you know, this is what I wake up in the morning to do, most people, they've got other, they got lives. And they, you know, politics, you know, is a couple of weeks before election time. And this kind of in this moment where we're not getting anything done, that that keeps them in a weird spot. Uh, Now, I look at the fact today that Schumer, uh, Chuck Schumer, the majority leader for for now, uh, says that they're gonna they're gonna look at changing the rules that go back to a talking filibuster. Something I believe they should have done all along. Now uh, he says that the American people deserve to see where their senators, uh, where they are on these bills, and he's gonna go forward to the vote. Uh, Elizabeth Warren says, look, all 50 senators, all 50 Democratic senators. Uh, believe that you know in voting rights and protecting the rights of voters, all of that stuff. They're just hung up on, on the procedure to that that gives Mitch McConnell a veto. Uh, and well, here's what ended up happening. You ended up having having Joe Manchin who come out today and said, not changing his mind, not changing his mind on the filibuster. Uh, so screwed they, they most certainly are. I'm gonna take a quick break. Right back after this, stick around. You listen to the Rick Smith Show. We're working people come to talk. America, let's do what we do best. Build. We have an opportunity to rebuild our economy, fight climate change, and create millions of jobs in the fastest growing industry in the country. Clean energy. But we must grab this moment before it slips away. American workers are ready. Now, Congress, it's up to you. We can achieve our clean energy future if we act now. It takes a lot to raise a family. A good job, a good salary, and some patience. A lot of people my age are drowning in college debt, but I chose a different path. I'm a member of the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I work hard for my job, and I love what I do. I had a lot of choices for my future, but I made the best choice for my family. IBEW, the right choice. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, thericksmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind, you can email me, rick, at thericksmithshow.com. So uh, I was watching this. Uh, I'm looking at this this um, NBC article, and they're talking about how to deal with uh, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and and all of that. And and it, it's it's one of those things that, you know, just kind of, you know, kind of remarkable to me that, you know, this is, I guess this is how we have to hold them accountable. Um, they're saying, look, there was a lawsuit filed last month uh, in federal court. Uh, they're seeking monetary damages from two of these these groups of Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and their senior members, the people who were linked to the uh, to the January 6th 
uh, you know, riot, insurrection, uh, seditious conspiracy, uh, however you're going to put that. But um, there they there there they were. Uh, they're in the process of suing them. And I'm going, you know, this is kind of a novel idea, the idea that, you know, we're just going to bankrupt them, you know, put them out of business. And look, I guess it's something we've done in the past. You think of the Klan back in the 80s? Um, yeah, so, hey, I, I, and at this point, I'm of the mindset, any way you can hold them accountable, you do. Uh, and as my son reminded me, you know, uh, we didn't get Al Capone for all of his crimes. Got him for tax evasion. Either way, still behind bars. Uh, and speaking of behind bars, I keep asking the question, why are not those folks in those five states? Uh, Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, those places that put forth forged uh, alternative electors. How come we don't have people in those states in prison? Because I got to think fraud, forgery, I got to think those are crimes. And here to share some thoughts on, well, are they crimes and are we going to see them being held accountable? I've asked our good friend Greg Pallas to come talk with us. Greg Pallas is an investigative reporter, author of How Trump Stole 2020, and tons of other books, uh, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, uh, my favorite. Uh, he's also a New York Times bestseller. You can check out his stuff at gregpallast.com. Greg, thanks for taking some time for us. Glad to be with you again, Rick. So let's start right with the, the first part of this. I, I mean, look at in these five states where we now find out there were there were forged elector certificates sent to the National Archives. And why? I mean, why now? Why haven't hasn't someone already been arrested on the day they were sent? You had to know somebody had to know they were illegal. Well, uh, blame the, the founding fathers <laughs> creating these bunch of little bastards. Our problem is that we have a constitution with the 12th Amendment uh, that says that, uh, you know, if there's not enough electors, then it goes to the House, one state, one vote. West Virginia gets the same vote as California. And so, of course, it, it's an invitation to fraud because you don't have to do much to overturn the will of the people. We don't have popular democracy in the United States. And that was deliberate. Uh, you know, John... Uh, uh, Quincy Adams wrote about how democracy was the most dangerous form of government he can imagine. That's why they wrote the Constitution, to overcome the democracy that was promised in the Declaration of Independence. So it goes way back. But yeah, look, where is our Justice Department in general? I mean, uh, obviously, it's not the Injustice Department that we had under the, under the Trump, um, under Bill Barr. But still, it's almost like uh, they're taking a very long nap here. Uh, there's a lot of people that ought to be in prison. For example, I mean, you take the instigators of the January 6th uh, uh, insurrection, like Ali Alexander. How come he's walking around? He was just at the Trump rally. How come he's not behind bars? You had cops who died. You had people who died in that insurrection. It, it wasn't a matter of um, disorderly conduct. It was a matter of murder. How come those people aren't in prison right now? I mean, not for these small BS charges, but for the real stuff. People no, die. I'm right there with you. I, and I keep asking now, you know, what's taking so long? And I know I've had a bunch of people say, no, Rick, you know, the wheels of justice grind slowly. We want the Department of Justice, you know, to be, you know, get their ducks in a row and do all that. And I, I do agree with that. But there's the other side of it. A lot of this stuff should have been laid out uh, last year. A lot of this stuff should have been, because the narrative, in my view, has been already changed. Eh, it was just another day at the Capitol. Uh, it was you know, just just another day of visitors you know, protesting. It was the people's house. They were allowed in, blah, blah, blah. The cops invited them in. Look, let me tell you something. I told you on our program, on your program before, my team with Zach B. Roberts, we got inside the organizations that planned the, uh, the January 6th events including, by the way, the women that held the rally, the Women for America First. They informed Mark Meadows, chief of staff, they informed Donald Trump personally that it would be illegal to march on the Capitol. And yet, and that's why they didn't let Alex Jones on the stage or Ali Alexander's crony, because they knew that they were going to say march the Capitol. But then a guy named Donald Trump said march the Capitol, knowing it was illegal to do so. It was a crime. It wasn't a crime breaking into the Capitol. I mean, that's certainly a crime. But it would not have happened if it weren't for an illegal march. That march was illegal. Trump was told, don't do it. There's no monitors. There's no permit. We've promised uh, in writing to the uh, uh, 
uh, to the Parks Department, to the, to the Capitol Police. So a crime was committed, and the instigators of a crime are usually responsible for the criminal activities. We just had a kid who was uh, a guy who was a, a, a minor executed because he was in a getaway car where someone was killed at a 7-Eleven robbery. He was a kid who was just running the getaway car. He wasn't trying to kill anyone. Yeah, he shouldn't have been involved in a robbery, but he's responsible. He's responsible. And he died in the electric chair. Well, what about Mr. Trump? What about Agent Orange? He did something which led to people dying. It used to be murder. I used to, you know, I used to work for the Justice Department when it was a Justice Department before it became an injustice department. Yeah, you know, I, yes, I agree with you. I'm not happy about it. Uh, now, I'm curious your thoughts on today's subpoenas. You got you know, the Trump Legal Brain Trust uh, who have been subpoenaed. Uh, thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, because it's it, when they say it's not his lawyers. These are people advising him on a, how to overturn elections. So, again, they were trying to use their concept is to use something called the 12th Amendment uh, of the Constitution, which is, uh, you know, which is horrific enough. Um, if you think that the Electoral College is bad, imagine one state, one vote. And that's what they're aiming for. Understand, it's not just what happened on January 6th. I'm very concerned about what's going to happen in January 6th of 2025, because if they can pull this off, see, they weren't prepared to pull it off, but they could do it where they challenge the electors in half a dozen states. Then it goes to a, um, an, a 12th Amendment vote. And remember, the second article of the Constitution, which I'm sure you just read recently. I know that you always read it before dinner. Yep. The second article of the Constitution, not the amendment, not the one about your gun. But the second article says that legislatures, not not the voters, but legislators choose the electors who pick the president. And I don't like it. Maybe you don't like it, but that's what they're aiming to do again. So what the January 6th group has to do is, number one, Trump was directly involved in instigating actions which led to people dying. That's one. You indict people for that. That's what the Justice Department is supposed to be doing. The second is look out for January 6, 2025. That's the date when they have to certify the next election for the presidency. And this time, they're not gonna be confused. They're not gonna have Mike Pence standing in the way. They're going to roll in, and especially if you have um, McConnell as the majority leader, you're gonna roll in and see them challenge states that, um, let's say Biden runs again and wins Georgia by 12,000 votes and Arizona by 14,000. You're gonna see those challenges this time. And this time, every Republican will vote to challenge those electors because they saw what happened. Think about it, Rick. What happened to all those Republicans who voted to impeach Trump? Out. Out what happened yeah. to all those electors who said that they wouldn't challenge the election? They're out or they're being primaried into oblivion. So it will not happen again. This time, the Republicans will be loaded for bear to challenge the outcomes of elections. So we got to be prepared for that. And this is where I think, you know, uh, you know, in the last segment, I had a caller, you know, saying, you know, you know, we're not going to get the voting rights and we shouldn't be spending all this time. We should be dealing at other things. And there's part of me that agrees with that. But I'm on the this this voting this voting reform is kind of a hair on fire moment. If we lose this ability yeah. right now to oversee what goes on in these states that are already rigging the elections, none of that stuff that, that you're talking about is going to matter because voting isn't going to matter. Okay, let, let me give you a couple. Let's get down to practicalities on this. You know, I've been going to a state called Georgia for nine years, uh, and I've been watching this. That's, I went down because Martin Luther King III, who just led the march um, yesterday, Martin Luther King III said, Greg, you know that Georgia is a blue state. If they let us vote, could you investigate? And I did. And, and every time I find a new trick, they've got another one. And the latest one, as I, and I've mentioned before, is this thing called voter vigilantes. We've, we haven't had that since 1946 in Georgia. What this is, under the law that was passed last year in Georgia, any voter can challenge any number of other voters' right to vote, They if, supposedly if they have information that they're not legal voters. Yeah. We had, I, if you go to gregpalace.com, you can see me confront one GOP official. In fact, I think she's now vice chair of the GOP in Georgia. Pam Reardon is her name. She personally, personally has challenged the right to vote of 30,000 Georgians in her county. 
30,000. Yeah. I said, how do you, have you called these people? Well, no, I can't call 30,000 people. Have you met any of these people? No, I, I've never met any of these people. I said, how come you're challenging their right to vote? And that's the Georgia law, 30,000 challenges by one voter. In fact, and what they did, you know where that came from? And you have to know some history here. Gene Talmadge was the Ku Klux Klan leader who became governor of Georgia in 1946. And then remember in 46, there were a lot of black voters in Georgia. And what he did was he passed out thousands of mimeograph forms and said, fill in the name of a Negro, except he didn't use the term Negro, fill in the name of a Negro and stop them from voting. And it worked, and that's how he became governor in 46. Now, Brian Kemp, running for re-election against Stacey Abrams, is now simply taking the Ku Klux Klan, handing out Mimeo forms, and taking it electronic. They're now handing out thumb drives with names of people to challenge. Ready? 364,000 voters have been challenged in Georgia by private individuals coordinated by the GOP in a group called True to Vote out of Texas. I'm trying to explain why we need to watch the vote and why we need this legislation. But without this legislation, we still have a Justice Department, which better get some uh, jets on here. We really need them now. No, Now's no, the absolutely. time, Merrick Garland. Now's the moment. No, and, and I look at this to, to highlight your point. You know, they did this in, in Virginia back in 2020 as well. 2016 and 2020, the, I think it was the Voter Integrity Project. I love that. Yes, the Voter Integrity Project, um, they challenged, they, they were the ones that pushed the interstate cross-check system in 2016. And what that meant was that in several states where anyone, they said, you, oh, if we knew that you voted in two states, we take away your vote. And who are the, I got a hold of the lists. I was the only journalist that said, give me those lists. And I found them. And what they said was voters voting in two different states, you know, they were all named, it seemed oddly, Jose Garcia, Maria Rodriguez, John Black. Uh, you're getting the point. Helen Ho. These are not names I'm making up. These are literally the names on the list that they said were people voting twice as opposed to maybe um, Jose Garcia. It may not be a common name for a Republican, but it's a common name for an American. But they knocked off these people's votes. These are the games that have been played. And, and just simple stuff. Rick, you know that when I was in, when I was in Cobb County in, in 2020 in the runoff for this uh, state, uh, for the US Senate with Ossoff and Warnock. Um, in Cobb County, which is Newt Gingrich's old county, it's big. It's the second biggest after uh, Fulton and Atlanta. And there were 11 early polling stations. When Biden won in November, they closed six of the 11 for the runoff. All six voting stations, all six out of 11 that were closed, were in African and American neighborhoods. They left open the white station. We had people driving 20 miles, African Americans driving 20 miles to vote, and they still won. They couldn't stop them. And so that's the good news, Rick. You can't steal all the votes all the time, but we sure better be diligent. I'm going back down to Georgia right now on this because you know what? With or without that law, we have a lot of work to do. No, we, we've got a lot of work to do. And I think it's important to understand all of these gimmicks that keep coming up time and time again. And I've been saying for a while, look, Republicans spend a lot of money on think tanks and on people dreaming up these horrible policies. And this, you know, I remember saying at the beginning, you know, last year in, in December when, when they were floating the idea of, you know, we got to get the vote back to the House of Representatives. And they were floating all these ideas on, on how they were going to maneuver this. And I was saying, look, they've gamed this out in these think tanks. They've spent tons of money doing it. And we, lo and behold, we find out, hey, there's, there's a memo, a two-page memo on how to do this. There's a PowerPoint presentation. There's all of this documentation on and, how and to way, do this stuff. You know, and, and I got labeled... You know, when I said that I actually wrote an article that uh, before and did interviews before the election in 2020 saying Trump could try to steal the selection using the 12th Amendment, this challenge to electors of different states and then having this Pence call a vote of the states in the House, one, one state, one vote, the 12th Amendment. You know that I was removed from from several, I was removed from YouTube. I was removed from uh, a Salon. Salon had actually nominated my work uh, as, for the Pulitzer Prize. And then they removed me because they said it was conspiracy stuff to say that Trump would lose the 12th Amendment. And then we get the Eastman memo 
in which it explains to Trump, here's how you use the 12th Amendment. And that's why they were pressuring Pence to use the 12th Amendment. But the thing was, they were trying to do it without all the senators and Congress people knowing about it. Now they're going to be in your face. They're going to be up front and they're going to try to use it. Um, you know, like this stuff. Yeah, it used to be considered conspiracy nuts stuff to think that someone's trying to steal the election using a very odd part of the Constitution. But now I would expect it. There's yeah. going to be an absolute attempt, and we got to be ready for it. Now, I've had people tell me I'm being hyperbolic that the steel is already in, and that if we, you know, we better start our own stop the steel movement, and it better be legislatively, and it better start with Democrats now, even though it doesn't look like Mansion or Cinema are coming around to it. Uh, something has to happen. Yeah, I think it's going to have to be in two places: the Justice Department, and then at the state level. We're going to have to fight this out at state level. And by the way, even if we had the the two voting rights bills passed, we'd still need to, you know, you can have all the laws you want. After all, we do have a, a shell of a Voting Rights Act. Yeah. We do have a, a 15th Amendment to the Constitution. The problem is, is that we need to organize on the street level. We also need to make sure that Republican Congress people in swing districts know they need to be asked, are you going to vote to overturn our vote in 2024? We need to get commitments. Absolutely. We need and, to get and, commitments. And, we need to get people in the streets, all of that. We need to get people to go ready. to redpalace.com to find more information. We need, we need, we need, we need, and we need you, Greg. Uh, I Thank appreciate you. the time, man. As always, great stuff. Thank you very much, Rick. See you at gregpalace.com. There Bye. you go. Make sure you check that out. And we'll get links out on how you can check out Greg's fantastic books. Quick I'm break. Rick. Over 70 years of experience in heart and aviation, the members of the Association of Flight Attendants know the realities of the aircraft cabin better than anyone. We don't just serve drinks, we save lives. We don't just negotiate contracts, we move major policy issues like the smoking ban, no knives on planes, clean water and safe food on board. The air we breathe matters and we stop the spraying of poisonous pesticides. Training, rest, and no calls on planes matter as we fight fires, de-escalate conflict, revive and breathe life. We safely usher passengers to the big business deal, the family vacation, the times of celebration, times of grief, and times of battle. We are aviation's first responders, and we are the last line of defense in aviation security. We are the first impression and the smile of aviation connecting the people of our nations. Fly with us, partner with us, make progress with us. The Association of Flight Attendants, stronger together, better together. Calling all builders. Your country is calling you. Tackling climate change is the job of our lifetime. It's time to build back better. Let's get to work. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So this is fun. Uh, and look, you know, as we've been talking about for the last couple of days, uh, the fight now in the Republican Party, and this is where the fun begins and where I'm kind of excited for the, the next couple of months uh, as, as Donald Trump and uh, Ron DeSantis fight for their position because uh, Trump clearly wants to maintain the uh, the king of the hill of the GOP. And DeSantis is going, no, no, that's me. I'm going to be the new guy. I'm going to grab the mantle. Well, uh, DeSantis, and, and look, we, we've known this, uh, he, but he's coming out with his police force. Uh, he says he's going to have about a budget of nearly eight, eight, I guess $6 million, and they're going to employ 52 investigators, and they're going to go and police the elections. They're going to hold people accountable except for well, all the criminals that did all the kind of stuff that we saw in the last election, you know, their people. And here to share some thoughts on the police force and maybe some of the crimes that went on in the last election. I've asked our good friend Christopher Hahn to come talk with us. Christopher is a syndicated radio host and host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast. You can check out his stuff over at ChristopherHahn.com. Christopher, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me, Rick. So let's let's jump right in with the first part of this. Uh DeSantis, police force, going to secure elections. No more questions in Florida about voter yeah. misconduct or fraud. Well, at least not from uh, the, those people anyway. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's funny. I thought after 2020's election when he came out and said, see, we do it right here in Florida. I didn't think there were any questions. 
about the election in Florida. Uh, I think actually he's looking for a problem that doesn't exist. And because to be a Republican in Donald Trump's America, you need to be uh, extremely ridiculous on election and on voting. You don't want anything to happen. And quite frankly, I don't get it, Rick, because I'm looking at polls right now. It's not looking good for the Democrats in the midterm. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, the, the it polls doesn't. I'm seeing, the polls I'm seeing right now, uh, are horrible for us coming up uh, in the midterm. You would think that the Republicans would want as many people as they can to vote. It's ridiculous. And you would think that they would kind of back away and just shut up for a while, and and yeah. not have the pie fight that I'm hoping is coming and that you're seeing brewing between the Trump wing and the growing kind of who's next wing. So that kind of infighting over the next several months could be quite entertaining and, and open a door for the Democrats to, to actually, you know, maybe take advantage of that. The way I see it, 45 percent of Republicans don't want Donald Trump to run for president in 2024, 45 percent. So that leaves a wide door open for anyone who gets in there and really makes a name. Whether it's DeSantis or somebody else, I think DeSantis is problem. He kind of reminds me of Ted Cruz in 2016. He was buttering up to the Donald for so, so long. And now he's trying to turn on the Donald, and the Donald is very quick to turn on people who turn on him. Ted Cruz, uh, you know, uh, learned that lesson the hard way when he basically accused his father of trying to kill Kennedy and his <laughs> wife of being ugly. <laughs> and now I find it ironic that the Trump supporters were in Dealey Plaza waiting for Kennedy's kid to come back from the dead. It's amazing. I, we, we're in such a screwy kind of place. You know, I was reading an article. Wait, Rick, wait, wait, Rick, wait, wait, wait. Before you move on to the next topic. Wouldn't you think that the people who went to Dealey Plaza and Kennedy didn't show up, don't you think at that point they would start, you know, questioning their life choices and who they believe and move back to like some sort of, you know, normalcy and maybe pick up the New York Times or the Washington Post or even a local newspaper to get their information instead of going on the web and getting it from somebody who's like locked in their mother's basement trying to make friends. It's ridiculous. No, we're about the same age. Uh, I grew up at a time where, you know, there were groups saying, you know, on Tuesday, the end of the world's coming. And yes. then they would reamend that because they knew the end of the world's coming. Uh, but it, maybe I've got the date wrong. Maybe it's six weeks from now. Maybe it's five I mean, years from now. There's a religion that's been around for over 100 years that started out on a doomsday cult, the Seventh-day Adventists. They were saying that the world was going to end on a certain date and then the world didn't end and their founder died and... They moved on to something else, some other scam. It's ridiculous. Which, yeah. Which is why I would reassess. Which is, which is why I <laughs> put the whole cute cookery, all those folks, all of the MAGA hat wearers, I put them into that death cult kind of kind yes. of category. It's a cult. It's not a political movement. It's not a party. It's a cult. And, and, because you're gonna yeah. believe anything no matter what. Even so when my, they might as well give the crazy stuff. Even when they are shown to be ridiculous with their own eyes. They go to Dealey Plaza, no Kennedy. I well, I, I guess they were waiting for this past weekend when they had the little shindig in Arizona, uh, that they were waiting for Prince and Michael Jackson. And uh, evidently there were a bunch of dead performers going to come back along with JFK Jr. I, I didn't see the headline that that happened, yeah, but no, uh, they, I, were, I, they were I, expecting I, it. I would have loved to see Prince again. He puts on a great show, but I don't know that he'd <laughs> want to share a stage with the Donald. I don't know that the Donald would let him. Uh, you know, a guy like Prince who's going to really just rock out the place and upstage to Donald, I don't think he'd enjoy that too much. But for me, the, the JFK Jr. thing is kind of interesting in that um, if you're looking at this, you're going, let me get this straight. You think JFK Jr.'s politics would align with, with Trump's politics and that they could coexist? You really believe that? Because then remember, it just shows me that you don't know anything about politics. Yeah. R remember, these people don't really read, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. They could just pick up an old edition of George the Magazine and they'll know his politics don't align with Donald Trump. I mean, the guy was more liberal than his dad by a mile. Yeah, no, just just crazy, crazy stuff. But, you know, I'm looking at DeSantis, though, and DeSantis is trying. Uh, I, I don't find him as dangerous as someone like Josh Hawley. Uh, you know, I, I think he's e more easily dismissed. Uh, but this idea of a police force, of, of, of another kind of police force, um, you know, going and targeting specific things, that's kind of frightening to me in, in giving a governor like DeSantis that kind of power to kind of, you know, threaten, intimidate, do whatever they've got to do, especially as you're looking around the country as Republican legislators uh, are in the process of putting massive roadblocks in front of people being able to vote. I mean, all of this yeah. for me comes back to, you know, the sanctity of the ballot box and the, the future of the country and this, this wonderful experiment of self-rule that we've been able to live under 
pretty much coming to an end. You know, I think his problem is in Florida, it's really hard to change the election law because they did a whole revamp of their election process after the 2000 debacle. So he's trying to do something to keep up with the Christie gnomes of the world or these places where the legislature could just write a blank check for the governor to, to do whatever they want with elections. It's kind of hard to do that in Florida. You're not going to take away early voting. You're not going to take away the various other absentee methods, which, by the way, a lot of Republicans in Florida use, particularly older Republicans use that. So he's got a real real problem keeping up with the Joneses in the Republican Party and trying to be the worst person in America on elections. So what is he going to do? I don't know. Let me have the shock troops that are going to go out there and investigate if any extra uh, people of color have voted. Uh oh, God forbid uh, somebody who's not a Republican shows up for the first time. We better find out what that guy's all about. Yeah, and we'll hunt them down and we'll we'll run them through the ringer just so that they know we're watching in the hopes that they'll eventually yeah. not vote and give up. Yeah. And that's what this is about more than anything. It's You're not going to find many people who are double voting. or you know, I mean, we found a couple here in Pennsylvania, both Trump voters. Uh, and that seems to be the, you know, the, what has happened over the last couple of election cycles. But if we're really going to go after the criminals, how come, and, and I, I've asked this to a number of people, uh, the people who forged the the certificates from from Arizona, from Nevada, mm. from uh, Wisconsin, from Georgia, uh, from Michigan, how come those people aren't behind bars? Yeah. That to me is that is massive fraud on they, an they enormous ain't behind scale. bars. They ain't behind bars yet. I want to know who was you know printing out those forms and sending them out. And I want that person in jail. Uh, and I think that look, uh, I feel like DOJ is really getting into a groove now with some of these indictments. And I expect more indictments. I know a lot of people were frustrated that it took time. You know, I'm a lawyer. Justice takes time. We don't want a justice department that's gonna knee jerk to the political base like the one we had under Trump for four years. We want a justice department that actually is gonna go through the process of seeking justice. And I think that's what's happening here. You saw it last week with the indictments of the Oath Keepers. I think you're gonna see more indictments of people who are committing these kinds of frauds on our elections and uh, I think it's going to be shocking where it ends up. No, I'm hoping you're right. And, and look, I, I, I've i always separated the difference between the committee and the hearings that are going on and the, the slow pace of that and what has to happen with the Department of Justice. Those are two very different things. Uh, the political on one side has to do what it has to do. Yeah. Uh, but on the other side, you have to you have to do the right thing uh, come uh, come the, the Department of Justice. But I'm looking at this. When these certificates were were first submitted to the National Archive, that moment they knew they had two certificates. One is yeah. authentic, one is not. Why was not someone knocking on someone's door the next day going, this is a crime, you're going to jail? Oh, we don't know that people weren't didn't have their doors knocked on, Rick. Get ready. I okay. think people's doors have been knocked on. And I believe that somebody will be held accountable for it. Whether or not this is a jailable offense, I don't know. But I think there needs to be some sort of accountability here. Okay, that's a good point. You're a lawyer. How is it not a crime to say that we've decided that we're going to put forth these alternative, uh, these alternate delegates, and we're going to pass this off as somewhat official uh, by putting seals yeah. on it and this kind? How is that not a crime? The minute they put it in the mail, it was mail fraud. So uh, there is, uh, you know, the postal inspector has a lot of power, too. And uh, I, I should refer you to a movie that's out right now called, I think it's called Queen Bees or something like that. It's uh, with Kristen, oh, God, Kristen Bell, where they're, like, committing mail fraud with coupons. It was, it, it's, it's, it's a good flick. Uh, you know, if you're stuck in a house like everybody in this country, uh, good thing to watch. But that, it really is mail fraud. And, and ultimately, these people can be held accountable that way as well. doesn't matter how you get them, Rick. Uh, no, Al no, Al Capone was, was tax fraud. I'll Al Capone was thrown in jail for, for, for income tax yeah. evasion. I want accountability. I want accountability. And again, I don't know that people spend years in prison for this, but there is some accountability that needs to be had here. And they did commit mail fraud, and they did try to defraud the United States. So if that doesn't happen, if we don't have people who are spending years in jail over this, because I think what happened on January 6th and all of the organizing that went around in this coup attempt is a pretty big freaking deal. 
Yeah. I think this is a pretty enormous deal that there was coordination. Five states submitted this. It wasn't like one yeah. guy said, hey, I got an idea. You had five states. They almost all look identical. There looks like there was coordination. There's the Eastman memo. Yeah. There's the PowerPoint. There's all of the texts and stuff that who knows how many people were read in on this stuff. This seems like, and, and again, I am not a lawyer. That's you. This seems yeah. like a conspiracy. It is a conspiracy. And it is going to come back on somebody in the Trump campaign, if not Trump himself. Somebody told them to do this. Somebody came up with that form and sent it around the country because it's the same form. It's too, uh, too much of a coincidence for anybody to believe that all these people have the same idea at the same time. So somebody's going to be held accountable for this. I can't wait. We're going to find out. And yeah. I, bet it's gonna be a, I bet you it's going to be a name brand person, too. It's a Steve Bannon or a Mike Flynn, uh, you know, Roger Stone. Somebody did this. Uh, it could be Eastman. It could be Mark Meadows. And we're going to find out. Uh, that, that is the hope. And I hope it's soon. Uh, now, today, the January 6th committee uh, is is um, subpoenaed the Trump lawyers, Giuliani and Sidney Powell. Um, is this possible since he, you know, there's that attorney client privilege? Is uh, how, You're the attorney. How much of that plays into this? Well, attorney client privilege is a, is a major privilege, but it is pierced when there is the commission of a crime, frankly. And if you are assisting your client in committing a crime, which Rudy Giuliani appears to me like he was, I mean, I think, you know, insurrection is, is a pretty big deal. Uh, I don't think the attorney client privilege uh, holds up for him. And also, quite frankly, was Rudy Giuliani being compensated for his time as an attorney? You, you can't just say I'm your attorney. There needs to be a retainer and compensation. Uh, I don't recall Rudy Giuliani being paid. I recall him asking to be paid. But I, I'd like to see his retainer agreement with Donald Trump. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see anyone's retainer agreement with Donald yeah. Trump. Uh, the one thing we've learned from Trump is he, he doesn't often pay his bills. Uh, so, totally. so there, there is that. Uh, you're listening to The Rick Smith Show here with Christopher Hahn. Christopher is a syndicated radio host, host of the Aggressive Progressive Podcast. You can find that at ChristopherHahn.com. We'll get links out on social media. Talking about people going to jail, I wanted to get your thoughts of uh, – uh, on the possibility of the Ma Matt Gates uh, indictment watch, which I have friends who are starting a countdown since the ex-girlfriend has now been granted immunity. Um, Florida, new election crime people, maybe take that money in, instead of putting it towards the election crime, maybe actual crimes like the ones that are alleged uh, for Matt Gates. What are your thoughts? Well, I'll believe it when I see it. I mean, it's been this has been coming down for a long time, this Matt Gates indictment. Um, you know, where is it? It seems to me, you know, six months ago, there was a pretty clear case that this guy was involved with that uh, that county treasurer, I think he was, uh, who 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 copped a plea and who supposedly was turning state's evidence on Matt Gates. Where's the indictment? Now, I get it. You're going to indict a sitting congressman, especially a high profile one like Matt Gates. You're going to cross your T's and dot your I's. And that takes some time. But I will believe it when I see it. And, and seeing his girlfriend, uh, you know, testify and be granted immunity, that that helps, I think, create it. But I don't want to hold out hope. I know, you know, I, I'm not, you know, first of all, I never like to see anybody go to jail. I, it's not my thing. You know, Rick, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I worked as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney in my career. I always felt for people going to jail, no matter how bad a person they were. Uh, and I think Matt Gates is one of the worst people in this country in a lot of ways. Uh, but that said, uh, justice is important. Accountability is important. If this guy was transferring teenage girls across state line for sex, he must be held accountable. The question is, you know, how much evidence do they have? And it, it's it's a pretty high standard if you're going to bring down a member of Congress. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with you on the jail thing, but I do like to see criminals held accountable. So do I. And, I don't want to If held I'm a judge, I wouldn't mind an alternative sentence for someone like this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, for this guy, I don't want an alternative sentence. If he's if he's bringing girls across state, young know, seventeen year old girls. I, I have a you know fifteen year old daughter. Yeah. And, you know that's not much younger. I, you know he's bringing fifteen you know seventeen year old girls across state lines for the purposes of having sex and doing drugs with them. Uh, you know, put him in jail for that. Yeah. No, as the father um, of two teenage daughters. Um, yeah. Uh, I can think of a better alternative sentence. <laughs> Yeah, give him to me for five minutes if uh -huh. I'm his father, right? Yeah. Give him to the father for I can, 10 minutes 
all is forgiven yeah. at the end of it if you survive if you survive 10 minutes which he won't which he won't and that is the <laughs> so. key uh, last question real quick i got for you on the voting rights thing we we didn't get to but uh, are we gonna get anything done on voting rights i know kristen kirsten cinema says she's all in support but not doesn't seem willing to do anything to actually move on that support uh, does anything well they, they they keep talking about making the filibuster a talking filibuster if that happens there's a chance but i do think that we will get something done probably not everything we want I would like to see some changes to the Electoral Count Act, where the vice president's role is clearly defined and where the states, if they are going to overturn the result of an election, have to go through some sort of judicial process all the way up to the Supreme Court before they are able to do that. There you go. Uh, and if, if we put that stuff together, uh, I think that would be a victory. Good stuff. I'm, I'm From the beginning, I said talking filibuster. That's where I want to go. It's where we should. Christopher, I appreciate the time, man. Always good talking with you. Anytime, Rick. Uh, good stuff. Christopher Hahn. Make sure you check out his podcast, The Aggressive Progressive Podcast. ChristopherHahn.com. We'll get links out on social media. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. Listen to The Rick Smith Show.